So let's begin with the first weapon that we talk about when we talk about innate immunity, the innate immune system, and that is called the complement system. So the complement system is a series of proteins that are made by your liver. And these proteins have names like C3, C4, C5, factor D, factor B, factor H. There are about 30 of these proteins in the complement system. And these proteins are going to be able to recognize and attack pathogens and help us get rid of them. And they're one of the first um, defenses, first line of defense that the body uses to recognize and try to eliminate pathogens before they can cause disease. So we're going to learn a, a lot of detail about how the complement system recognizes a pathogen and reacts to remove pathogens from the body. So the complement system, they're just proteins made by the liver, and they're dumped into your bloodstream all the time. So even if you're not infected, you are making complement proteins. Um, so they're patrolling the body. Where are you finding complement proteins in your body right now? They're present in your fluids. So they're made by the liver all the time. They're sent into the bloodstream, so they're floating in your blood plasma. Um, they will enter tissues, um, so the extracellular fluid in tissues, that interstitial fluid, you're going to find them there. You'll especially find them there if there's inflammation going on. So we talked about inflammation a little bit and um, increased vascular permeability. So when blood vessels become leaky, more fluid moves from the blood into tissues. And one of the things that brings that goes with that fluid is complement proteins. So complement proteins are moving from your blood plasma into your tissues a little bit if you're not infected, a lot if you are infected and have inflammation going on. And those complement proteins can be drained into the lymphatic system as well via the lymph. So these proteins are pretty much present all around the body in your fluids, and they're going to be used to detect extracellular pathogens. They're not going to look at intracellular spaces. They're going to main stay outside of cells. So anything in the extracellular space, they hopefully will recognize an attack. Um, so we've got to learn some things about uh, complement. First of all, like I just said, one of their functions is to recognize pathogens in the extracellular fluids. And once they recognize them, they will really do a number of things that involve destroying the pathogen. That's great, so we don't get sick. And they're also going to help other things destroy the pathogens. So that's an introduction to complement. Um, these are proteins. So what are the functions of these proteins? Many of them are proteases, which you should have learned about in biochemistry. A protease is an enzyme that cleaves proteins. So many of these proteins that I'm showing you here not all of them, but many of them are proteins that cleave proteins. And we're going to learn the specific substrates for each of these proteins. So for every protease we talk about, you got to know the substrate. So you might want to make a chart or a table for each protein that is a protease, what its substrate is. The other thing that you need to know about many of these proteins is that they are zymogens, which means they are inactive sometimes and are active other times. So you hopefully learned about in biochemistry, enzymes. Enzymes can be active, but enzymes can also be inactive. Many of these complement proteins, um, when they're circulating in the bloodstream uh, and there's no infection, they are inactive proteases. Something's going to trigger them to activate, which we'll learn about soon, uh, and they'll be active proteases and start to cleave proteins. So when complements or proteins are floating around your body, they might be inactive if there's no infection, and they become active when there is an infection. So the other thing that you need to know about for these uh, complement proteases is when do they become active. So keep that in mind when you draw some sort of chart or table about complement protein enzymes. Okay. Here's the pathogen. There's a virus on the bottom, a bacteria at the top. So let's talk about complements. Um, the main complement protein is C3. This is the most important complement protein. So C3 is going to be manipulated by many different things. But the manipulations will all involve C3 being cleaved into C3A and C3B. So C3 is just a protein. Proteins can be cleaved. Right? You can cleave the peptide bond between some amino acids. And that's what happens with C3. There's going to be protease coming along and cleaving C3 into two pieces, C3A and C3B. So these are just protein fragments of C3. Many things are going to do this, and we'll learn about all of them. When 
C3 is cleaved into C3A and C3B, C3B can be covalently attached to the surface of pathogens. So what I've drawn there is a covalent bond. You remember bonds, hopefully interactions, you know, electrostatic interactions, hydrophobic interactions. This is a covalent bond linking C3B to the molecules on the surface of a virus or a bacteria or a parasite. And this is called complement fixation. You're marking something for destruction. You're marking something for attack. The best way to mark it is to physically and covalently attach it to it. So many things we're going to see activate C3 and link it to uh, pathogens. So when you attach C3B to a pathogen via a covalent bond, that is called complement fixation. When C3 is cleaved into C3A and C3B, that is called complement activation. And there are three ways to activate complement. We're going to first talk about the alternative pathway of complement activation. So within minutes of an infection, the alternative pathway will trigger C3 to cleave into C3A and C3B. And we'll learn about what cleaves that shortly. The second pathway of complement activation is called the lectin pathway. This can work within hours to days um, it takes to trigger the lectin pathway, but that can also trigger C3 to be cleaved to C3A and C3B, and then attaching C3Bs to a pathogen. The final pathway is called the classical pathway of complement activation. This could take days to weeks to activate, um, but once it does, again, it leads to C3 being cleaved to C3A and C3B. So um, all these pathways could be taking uh, place simultaneously, um, but typically the order we talk about them occurring in the body is alternative pathway, then the lactin pathway, and then the classical pathway. But they can also all be occurring at the same time, depending on if the things that need to start them are all present. And we'll learn what, to, what needs to start all of these pathways in separate videos. Um, what does complement do when it's fixed to a pathogen? So these are the effector functions. And there are three main effector functions for complement, regardless of which pathway started it. Once the complement is fixed to the pathogen, C3Bs are attached to the pathogen, three things can occur. The first thing is opsonization. And this is a concept that's introduced in Chapter 1 if you need to review it. And um, Opsonization just refers to anything you attach to a pathogen, and that thing makes the pathogen more attractive to phagocytes, such as macrophages. We introduced macrophages, and we'll have a whole separate video on macrophages. Macrophages are phagocytes. They love to eat things. But if you cover that thing with something that makes it even more attractive to phagocytes, like uh, macrophages, that's called opsonization. So when you cover a pathogen with C3Bs, macrophages are really attracted to it and will eat it more likely than if it wasn't covered with um, complement. So that's called opsonization. Second is complement fixation will lead to the formation of the membrane attack complex. That involves complement proteins drilling holes into the membranes of pathogens and popping them like balloons, draining them of their cytoplasm. So we'll learn about the formation and structure of the membrane attack complex. Third, inflammation. When complement becomes activated, that reduces a state of inflammation. And inflammation is going to help bring immune proteins and immune cells to a site uh, to help attack a pathogen. So we're going to go into great detail onto each one of these pathways, and we'll have separate videos on the pathways as well as separate videos on the effector function. F functions.